Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you join over 350,000 people just like you who are taking control of their wellness journey with viome when it comes to choosing the right food and supplements for you don't guess test with viome's health intelligence test you get over 30 health insights based on your unique biology and your gut microbiome you also receive personalized food recommendations and precision supplements formulated literally just for you. Use code GENIUS to get an extra $20 off a health intelligence test. Visit Viome.com to shop now. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius Podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going, and I love coffee. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Dr. Diane McGrath. She's a sustainability expert, a TEDx speaker, and a prior Mars One astronaut candidate. And we're going to talk about uh, sustainability and how can the perspective uh, from being outside of Earth in outer space uh, and you know other types of perspectives, how can that uh, help us here on Earth to be more sustainable and you know, achieve our environmental goals? So, Diane, thanks for coming. Uh, you're welcome, Richard. It's fantastic to be joining you this morning. Well, this afternoon for you. Hey, man. Um, well, in your own words, tell me um, a little bit about your background and then why you're, you're working on what you're working on right now. Sure. So my background, um, so my, my research area in particular is, uh, is sustainability and sustainable systems. Uh, my background is really quite diverse. Um, we can either look at my upbringing as a child where I lived in Aboriginal communities in the desert in the Northern Territory in the an area that people don't know a lot about from my history, where I did truly learn how scarce our resources were, especially food. And then if we go, uh, go fast forward a long way into my career where I worked in large multinational, so GSK, you guys probably know GSK, um, pharmaceutical industry, and, uh, and then Australian government. And I've been working as a sustainability consultant and researcher for the last probably eight to ten years now. So a varied sort of our background, but most of it driven by resources and scarcity and systems thinking. So what does that mean you're a sustainability consultant? What are you looking at? What are you trying to uh, make sure is sustainable and ongoing? Sustainability, I mean, if we look at the traditional, I guess, um, the definition of the term, it, we really try to think of how can we look at any individual resource and be able to use it in the same 
manner in an ongoing basis um, so that it's still there for ourselves and for the future use of, of all of people. And, uh, and so for myself, I'm really interested in food in particular, but all resources. And, um, and this, I think some of this, as well as childhood, being driven by living in the outback and having to hunt for my own food, no shops around and, and so on, um, it sort of came to an interesting exploration of this when I was working with GSK and I was head of the uh, of a one of the vaccine portfolios. I was a brand man, global brand manager for the childhood immunisation vaccines uh, worldwide, and um, and we were challenged with having to try and change our packaging globally. Like, how do we make packaging sustainable? Uh, I don't know what it's like where you are, Richard, but packaging is a huge issue for for waste, uh, for recycling, for uh, people don't know what's recyclable or not, and they make their make, make mistakes all the time, wrong thing, wrong bin. Uh, and the likes. But what we were looking at at GSK at the time was how do we turn this packaging into something which is is is, a, is sustainable that we can continue to use and and re, and access as a resource on an ongoing basis, but also then represents what our customers, what the users, what everybody expects us to be doing. So it was a really interesting balance. We had to take well, a but, yeah. but what does that mean sustainable? I mean does, does that mean you want to recycle a higher percentage of the packaging as possible? I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, exactly. So is it about the inputs as well? Where are the inputs from? So to produce the packaging, what sort of inputs were we using? Were they from a source that was maintaining the supply of that source on an ongoing basis? Um, were they paying their staff properly? If we think about some of the paper choices we make and, and if we look at um, the production of fabric, for example, this is a, a big issue at the moment in, uh, that we're, our governments are turning our attention to as well. How do we ensure that people who are working in the fabric industry are paying their staff appropriately so that the sustainability means that people can also survive? It's about being able to open the door the next day, get a meal the next day and, and so forth as well. Um, but when it comes to the packaging, if we step back to that, Richard, it was about like let's have a look at the inputs. We had choices of, of cardboard, we had choices of different plastics, of obviously glass, a number of different components that we could have used for the packaging. And we assessed that based on, well, what are the energy inputs that were a part of creating that, as well as what the physical resources were, were they dug out of the ground, were they grown? So a lot of things had to be taken into consideration to work out what impact even just the collection of the input materials would have on the environment, uh, whether that be water use, energy, petroleum, and you can start to get the extent of the research we had to do to work out even just from the inputs of the possible pack packaging options. Mm. If you want a crazy, incredibly difficult task that you, I don't even know if you would be allowed to do it, try yeah, it yeah. with cars, electric oh vehicles versus uh, gas-powered vehicles to see what the real inputs and externalities are both yeah absolutely and a lot of people forget about externalities yeah that you picked right on the um the, one of the challenges there richard people don't think about the external impacts they think about the direct inputs but they don't often think about what's happening outside of that as well the the other um effects that using that material could have um and that's one of the things that when it comes to I mean, the work I do at the moment, I'm um, in a team in Australia called Stop Food Waste Australia, which is like Refed in the US or RAP in the UK. So um, large multinational partnerships, um, organisations, industry, et cetera, that are trying to halve our food waste in this country. And, and we're looking at things from not just a perspective of well, can we drop food waste, of course, in tonnage um, and also value, but also what is the environmental impact of that? Um, what about if we are growing less food because we're not wasting as much, we're actually eating more of it, perhaps farmers are using less fertiliser, perhaps there's less irrigation water required, um, perhaps there's less fuel needed for transportation. And so all of those other inputs um, that we don't think about other than the direct uh, actual element that we're measuring are things that we needed to consider when it came back to that packaging consideration as well. Yeah, I read a book years ago called Cradle to Cradle. Mm. They talked about deliberately making, you know, furniture like couches so that they can be disassembled and as much of it could be reused as possible. I know it's like, Absolutely. let's say, a fruit, you know, like an apple, once it rots, you 
can't do that, but um, maybe the packaging, you can go that route where it's deliberately made to be recycled or reused somehow or disposed of with a maybe a bottle deposit or some kind of deposit you get back for you know, as an incentive for recycling it and returning it to the maker. Yeah, and I know that the um, European Union are well ahead of a lot of us in this area. They're, they're complete consideration of those circular economy systems where the, there's a, a real responsibility of the producer to to take back and to do something else with that product or to make sure that every item um, or every component of that product can be recycled. Uh, we see this especially with white goods, so refrigeration, um, washing machines and uh, items of that nature. Um, but actually coming back to the apples, a really interesting point that you made, Richard, uh, and this is part of some research I did. We talked about um, the aspect of seeing our planet from space. Um, I've been one of the Mars One astronaut candidates, uh, shortlisted out of uh, 200,000 to the last 100. And when Mars One closed its doors last year, which was unfortunate, um, didn't mean my interest in space diminished at all. Uh, in fact, it's continued. And But one of the things I did do as part of the time in the Mars One program was I went and spent two weeks in the Mars Desert Research Station that the Mars Society has in the Utah desert. And I spent a couple of weeks there doing a research project, trying to look at what that closed system looks like for food. So, because we have to, I don't know how well yourself or your listeners might know um, the Mars Desert Research Station at all and the work they do. It's, yeah, the, I've never heard of it. What, what do they do? It's fantastic. It's a, uh, it's a simulation environment. So it's a... Um, it's quite isolated, as you can imagine, in the Utah desert. Uh, and what you do is you go there in in teams of researchers and you undertake research projects that can help us understand how we might live or work in space or on Mars. Uh, and so it's quite a very small contained space. And we were in a crew of four, as myself and three gentlemen, um, and you spend two weeks in this environment and you can't go outside unless you're in a space suit uh, and you're eating food that will be quite similar to what you might be eating on Mars or in space, so freeze-dried mostly or, or preserved foods, that uh, nothing fresh really. Um, so I was really interested in that two-week period when you're doing this research to understand, well, okay, if we're going to be living on Mars in the future, and that was what Mars One's premise was, it would be one-way trip, you're going there to you know, set up a new um, society on another planet in our solar system, we would have to grow all of our own food to survive. We would have to be continually reusing, recycling, repurposing everything. Energy would be renewable, water recycled, everything. And so, which is what we kind of had in the Mars Desert Research Station. It was all um, off-grid, um, pretty much no internet, uh, water was recycled and the like. And so with the food system, we did have a small greenhouse, and what I know from the Mars project, what they were looking to do for Mars One was to grow all of the food they needed to survive. But, of course, as we know, an apple doesn't grow in a day. So to be able to grow our food, there'd be a period of time in which we'd be eating this freeze-dried food, this reconstituted food, and, uh, and other sorts of foods of that nature. And so I was, my mind went to, well, let's think about this closed-loop system, these, these inputs Every part of it, we think about what the apple needs to grow, it's going to be getting some nutrient from somewhere. Now, there's no hardware store or nursery down <laughs> over the next crater, so I wasn't going to be able to resupply with fertilizer and buy extra compost. Mars doesn't have organic matter in, this, in, their, well, in their regolith, in the soil either. It's not soil, really. It's regolith. Um, so I had to think about, if, on this instance, if we would be providing the inputs into growing the food from our waste that we would be not eating or part of our food preparation from all of this reconstituted food. And so my two-week period in the, the MDRS or Mars Desert Research Station was to examine how much waste a crew of four might create out of the food that they, that they make and consume uh, and also what the nutritional quality was of that food waste because that is what the plants would be eating. And so that's what I, I measured during that time period. and and picked up, unsurprisingly, that uh, when there's not a lot of food, people eat a lot more. And when the food is uh, also reconstituted, there's not quite as much waste. Um, so there was very small inputs that were going to go into any sort of compost system at all. And it was quite 
uh, I guess, quite s s salty. <laughs> so that would have been a, an issue for managing the solar systems as well on Mars. Why not, uh, I mean, why Mars? Why not the moon instead? Of, yeah, I, I thought about it. Why not just start in, I mean, we have, you know, I know it's colloquial, but there's food deserts in the U.S. and in other countries. Yeah. But, but literally, I mean, why not start in the, the Somali desert and just see how you can help people that live there with fewer resources, you know, be sustainable and then move on to like a big crazy project like Mars. Why go for the big crazy stuff? I love going for the big crazy stuff because it helps us find solutions for the stuff that's closer at hand. And uh, we see a lot of the technology we use today and probably your listeners are very familiar with this um, is from space science and space research and, and uh, space technology. So you and I wouldn't be able to speak today if we didn't have satellite technology, which has come from all of the, the work to, to getting humans into, into space. And that's, I think if we aim to do something so incredible to be sustainable on Mars, then we will have to design systems and understand systems. And here we are coming back to full systems thinking um, about all of the interconnected and interrelated aspects of that when it's so contained. Um, and by able, when we can finally see the boundaries of our system, we're much more aware of it. We have a deeper understanding and knowledge of it. And, and that's, I guess, a, the lesson here that we bring back to what we can do on Earth and how we can take this way of seeing the planet differently. Our planet is just a closed-loop system as well. It's just very large in its boundaries. So if we can take the, the lesson of understanding all of the critical connected elements of the system, then we can appreciate them and we'll actually treat them with more respect. So I, I think by, by learning how all of those elements are interconnected in such a, a tiny space like we would have on Mars, for example, we can find solutions that will work for us here on Earth because we have to test them and trial them here. We won't be able to just go to Mars and expect things to, to work for us. We must prototype them here. We've got to scale them up. We're going to review and revisit and remodel and then build scale, full-scale projects as well that are operable here on this planet. So I think, I think Richard, if we try and do this sort of stuff for, for Mars, for the moon, then we will find solutions for our food deserts because this is a critical issue, even in our, I think, our urban environments too. I don't know what it's like. Whereabouts are you based? Which are the cities? I'm um, in, in Texas, Austin, Texas. In Texas. Okay, well, Austin's, um, okay, so he's got parts. I've been to Austin. It's a fantastic city. Um, great, great food. Big fan of the food in Austin, especially the brisket. Okay. So, and music. What a great city for music. Just brilliant. So I know, like, Austin is is quite a large city and there are areas of Austin where people don't necessarily have access to fresh produce, for example. And so you have, we often have food deserts almost within our urban environments too. So how can we ensure we can develop robust and resilient communities that can support each, support the life that's in there as well? Um, this is about urban agriculture too. Um, this is about access to food um, within food co-ops and uh, and other systems of delivery that might look at that more circular economy. What can we do locally? And I think that's some of the stuff that w I think COVID, I don't know what lockdown periods were like at all, if you had many in, in Austin at all, Richard, where, I, where I'm based in Australia, in Canberra, we had um, a couple of months' worth of lockdown and very short periods uh, of being outside and we couldn't travel very far. We really <laughs> learned very quickly uh, what our food resiliency was like in, the, in our food system. It, it, we recognised how difficult it was to be able to get the things we wanted, but we ended up surviving with what we had. And I, I think there's a lot to learn from this period that we've been through. Um, I don't know, did you experience similar things in the States? Uh, not where I was, you know. We're... Um... Mm. You know, China is 100% insane. We were yeah. uh, way down on the scale, you know, so it wasn't uh, nearly as bad here. But, but what, what lessons have you learned about um, food? I mean, is, it, is the idea to make it stretch further? I mean, even if you waste less, how is that mm. supposed to translate down to the consumer, let's say? Well, if we waste, I mean, part of it, you touched on some of the lessons we can learn from our households. We found during the COVID lockdown periods, any areas or households that were locked down tended to, um, after some periods of adjustment, buy less food. So they, there was usually less food wasted in the most part. There was more food stored 
so there were people were buying things um, yeah, to, for surplus in the for storage uh, in some periods, but then they got to a, a not quite sustainable, but um, a period of, of purchasing less and getting into a system uh, in their their processes in their households of wasting less food as well. Uh, and we saw this in a number of countries too. This is not just unique to Australia. Uh, and we can take those lessons on board um, about what happens next. It's like, well, what do we really need? Most people tend to be quiet. In, in Australia, we're quite an affluent society on the most part. There is obviously poverty as well. Um, but in the most part, this country is quite affluent compared to many other nations in the world. Uh, and right. so people have an expectation. There's this perception of value where we expect more and we like to show that we have more and can afford more. But when there's this affluence and abund we create abundance, then we also create an excess of of food, of any sort of resources that go to waste. So here we have an opportunity to, to think again about what we actually need and how can we share that? How can we use local food donation systems? How can we, and that was one of the things that came out during COVID as well. Businesses that had to close doors all of a sudden had huge surpluses of food. Some of it went to charities, others got repurposed and um, turned into to meals that became home delivery. So the people had to really rethink about what they could do with what they had and make it something which wasn't going to waste, but actually an opportunity. And I think there's some lessons in all of that for us. Well, what are the lessons? That buy less, <laughs> keep less in stock. It's part of it. Um, but also when we do have what, um, when we do make purchasing decisions, make them decisions that allow us to be able to have multiple functions for that item. So if we think about whether it's food for Mars or whether it's food that we're going to keep in store because we might have to go into lockdown, are we going to use that? We, is it going to be, I don't know, let's think about an unusual ingredient. Are you going to buy a kilogram of okra that you're going to put into um, a curry and use it once and then you don't know what to do with the rest? Buy an ingredient or keep an ingredient in the cupboard that you're going to have multiple functions for. And then at the end also has another purpose. So, um, for example, it can go into compost or it can be used to, to feed you if you if people like pets. It's part of um, the pet food. So think about multiple multiple functions for, for any purchase that you make. But what, what is the goal? Just buy less and that's it? Or is it to help people <laughs> that have food insecurity? Or is it to help the environment? Or is it what, you know? Well, it does a bit of both. Um, so, Richard, if we, if we do buy less, then we have an impact on the environment. So going back to what we talked about earlier about inputs and externalities, when we buy less, that sends a signal across the market about less is needed to be kept in a store. So less is then produced potentially by uh, a manufacturer of that food. And so then less ingredients are bought by that manufacturer from perhaps um, you know, a grower. And so that grower doesn't necessarily need to produce as much product, so they don't need to buy as much fertiliser, as much use as much water. So it goes completely through that food system. When we don't waste as much food, if we don't purchase as much food, then not as many um, resources are needed to grow that food. And at the other end of the pipe, if we're not wasting as much food, we're not putting as much into landfill, and when food waste goes into landfill and it gets covered over, then we have the creation of, of methane, which is usually about 21 times stronger than carbon dioxide as a, a greenhouse gas. And so we see a huge impact on the environment just by allowing food to go to, to landfill. So if we can reduce that, we can cut our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and in fact, I mean, in the US, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that uh, occur each year because of lost or wasted food, it's the equivalent of 32, over 32 million cars. I just don't think that, that you know, I, I'm not going to say it's blaming people, but no, no. I mean, people want to buy what they want to buy. Why not the users of, of it changing their packaging, let's say, to be less wasteful? Or Yeah, you know, that's another offering, solution, absolutely. Uh, different sizes. I mean, just telling someone don't buy as there much. There are multiple. And, there, oh, you're absolutely right, Richard. There are multiple ways we could deal with this. This is... a when we look at all of, understand the system deeply, it's not just about I'm buying a lot and so I'm wasting it. Sometimes my purchasing decision might be because I have very little choice. It could be because the, the size of the package that someone's selling something is so huge. And so it could be I, only, I might only need to eat or want to eat five apples in the week, but they only sell them in these um, 12 apple packs. 
for example. And so the other apples are going to go soft by the time I get to them. So there's lots of things that are causing sometimes us to purchase some of the things that we buy. And that's where we there is a responsibility on the producer and on packaging, definitely. Some of the solutions that are coming out in packaging innovation at the moment um, are seeing some products have a much longer shelf life, which is fantastic for us at home. We're not going to waste it. It'll, it'll keep its, uh, its use by and, and freshness um, for a lot longer. In fact, there's a, some new packaging which is coming out uh, which can preserve an, um, an avocado, like a, a smashed avocado, for, um, for weeks now. You know how unusually Azure avocado goes quite brown within a few days, but this packaging will keep it fresh for a couple of weeks. It's fantastic stuff. So, um, well, days, I, I mean, avocado goes within minutes. Discover how your gut microbiome is impacting your cellular health, immune health, and how you're aging from the inside out with Viome's Health Intelligence Test. Collect your samples, send them to the Viome Lab, and within two to three weeks, your health scores and food and supplement recommendations will be available to you right in your Viome app. Visit Viome.com and use code GENIUS to get an extra $20 off your health intelligence test. I know, so innovative packaging can make a huge difference on, on, how, um, on how long we can have fresh food for. So it has a big impact. Um, same thing with our distribution systems too. The further food has to travel, the less fresh it is by the time it gets to us, especially if that, um, that transportation, is, its cold chain is interrupted in some capacity, which usually it is. So improving cold chain practices, um, reducing distribution distances. There's a lot of things we can do to try and reduce how wasteful we are with our food because it's not all in the households. Although about a, about a third of it is in households, but the rest of it is up the supply chain. Well, I mean, there's plenty of stores that throw away tons of stuff. They, they, there's laws where they can't resell it or they just mm. won't want to sell it or the use by date. Like I did a whole podcast with someone that talked about all the different ways they code food. And it's not yeah. necessarily when it's going to spoil. And then there's use by, good by, use before, mm. use on or before. So there's like a whole, you know, I mean, there are many levels where there's waste. But the climate now, I, I just don't see mm. people, I mean, if, they, if things are more expensive, yeah, they'll buy less. But everyone's so insecure right now. We're being told that there's food insecurity that's going to grow. I think now people are going to be stocking up like crazy. So I don't know if yeah. in this environment that there's going to be any headway right now. And, and with supply chains being disrupted, yes, we're going to have to go more local, which is great, and that'll help reduce mm. waste. But I don't know. It's just the environment as I see it now, but what do I know? No, no. <laughs> well, I think this is where the potential for our um, – I don't know what the, the councils or, or governing areas are in, in your area, uh, Richard, but um, local councils have, a, have the responsibility for waste in Australia. And as a – as a result, that they're, they're trying to find solutions to, to bulk collect the waste. Um, so this is as in organic waste. So to re get households to mix their food waste with their garden waste so that then gets collected and taken to a compost system. So then that responsibility, because people are still going to create waste, it happens. You, you, burn, you burn a piece of toast, you um, accidentally cook for someone who doesn't turn up to a dinner. All these sorts of things occur. This is life. And so waste will happen, but it, how can we then make sure it doesn't go to landfill? Because that was, if we can reduce, if we can reduce how much we waste food, like if, if there was zero food waste, for example, greenhouse gas emissions would drop by six to eight percent around the world. So this is quite dramatic. So if we can, if we can find a way to divert it from going to landfill, if we can take it to compost systems or produce animal feed, like going through um, insect systems, so such as black soldier flies, for example. Um, that will produce both compost as well as animal feed um, with protein. So there's, there's lots of opportunities for that to occur. Even if we're, I think you're right, there will be in insecurity, people have a response to, to stock up and there'll be surpluses in cupboards. We won't see going out of date for or well, probably at least another six to 12 months. But there's also no, I mean, there's not really instruction. So, you yeah. know, like we'll take food home. I mean, I, I can look at the dates on the packaging and say, all right, I'll use it. I won't use it. But, you know, I can tell you, like, when, I don't know, milk's on its last day, I'm like, should I use it or not? I don't know. Or if it's one day after, you know, I, I can't help but get the feeling of, uh, maybe I shouldn't have this. So mm -hmm. I think also maybe some education for people on how to, store stuff, more. 
how long uh, it absolutely. actually is good for, what do you look for to make sure it's not good? That might help a lot too. Yeah, for sure. And I think we've got a similar problem with our date labels here on, on packs is sometimes there are multiple date labels on the same pack and it's so confusing for the, the consumer, the shopper. They look at the labels and get really confused and so they take their precautionary measure and just go, oh, I'm not sure, I'll just throw it out. Um, and in fact, only half research shows that only half of Australians can tell the difference between um, the different use by and best by and best before dates. So, i.e., the rest of them are just being safe and throwing it out, which is what they do. It's the main reason people throw food out because they don't think it's safe to eat anymore in Australia anyway. And it's very similar in the US, I understand. Um, but also, oh, uh, if if that's the main reason, then that might want to be the point of attack. Because look, if I if I don't throw away as much food, then I, I don't have to be forced. I don't have to be told. Yeah. If I have still three bananas left, I'm like, all right, I don't need to go to the store. So I'll, you know, like down the line, I'll just shop less and I'll buy less if I can keep my stuff longer. And I think that might work better than telling someone to just buy less because, <laughs> you know, what's, what's the start of the problem here? It's like, I'm not intending to buy too much stuff. I don't want it to be wasted. I don't like it. But if I'm unsure of when I could eat it and what to use and how to store it, then you know, it kind of goes up the chain from there. So maybe that's the Yeah, it becomes empowered. It's an empowerment of food literacy, really, isn't it? It's it's something that we don't really learn at schools in the way that I think we used to in the past. Um, there used to be home economic classes that were very much um, around what to do with every type of food you can think of in your household. Um, but now it's a, it's a little different in the schools. And so I think we've lost a lot of that food literacy that our grandparents had for sure. I don't know what your grandparents uh, were like, Richard, but my my grandmother was uh, able to – she could cook anything out of anything. There was never a, a, a drop of food or ounce of food wasted. And so she also would know, oh, the milk's gone bad. I can bake with this instead. It makes fantastic input into baking bread. Um, so, mm. But this is – we don't – this isn't common knowledge these days, whereas it is in our grandparents' era who would know this stuff. Um, so I think you're right. And whose responsibility is that? This could be a partnership that we see our, our retailers, our big supermarkets, having that, having that communication with their customers because then you're going to have customers who are, know they're going to get the best value out of what they're buying. It's like, oh, if it doesn't matter if it goes out of date, I can now make bread with that milk or whatever it might be. Yeah, and I don't know what the role, how big a role restaurants play, especially mm. with delivery, DoorDash or Deliveroo, I heard you guys have. And, you know, so the restaurant, obviously, they want to, make the most margin and restaurants throw away unbelievable amounts mm. of food so yeah. what's what's to be had there what's to be done there as well it's challenging isn't it because it it's the the delivery the product has to come to our households in packaging which is going to keep it fresh um, and to ensure that it doesn't spill um, but we also i don't know about you but i don't know what the size of that meal is going to be you take a bit of a guess sometimes for these delivery options if it's not a place you've bought from before. Um, and we know that other than fresh fruit and veg that goes off, one of the most common things that other people throw away is what's left over from takeaway. So these takeaway meals that we get, um, maybe we buy ourselves and bring back or have delivered, uh, are very commonly thrown away or parts of them are thrown away because we just don't finish it. Um, so there is an option that businesses could have slightly smaller portions in there. So they want to make you, they want to make a better margin. So they could actually reduce the portion size marginally as well, because that would increase the profitability per dish served. Uh, and this research from the States, a, a group, um, Barbara Roll's team um, did with chefs uh, who said that um, most diners don't recognize if the portion is about 10 to 15% smaller. So this is a simple, simple solution there that could serve us a little bit less. Sure, charges are, you know, a few cents less per dish, I, I, whatever works for you. I won't notice if it's 10% less. It's not going to be a big, big deal to me. Well, I've also heard there's uh, some sh shrinkflation starting to occur, you know, less chips in a bag, less this, less that. One interesting thing you maybe think is really odd but makes sense, I've seen that um, delivery people are starting to, to eat food from the deliveries you know, we'll yeah. order French fries or something and like there's a lot less. And, you know, when we go to the same store and buy it, there's a lot more. So it looks like delivery people right now, I guess, because they're getting squeezed, they're literally eating a right. few French fries or a little bit of this and that out of the meals. So right. I know like in uh, in Australia, one friend told me they were like stapling the bags of fries and 
yeah. you know, having to close the packages more securely so people wouldn't steal the food out of it. So it's all kinds of crazy stuff going along with, uh, around with food. But there's a lot to, they, be, to be done to mm, fix, you know. Yeah, and it's, 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 just, it's what else is happening in that system there. The drivers, as you say, are being squeezed. So perhaps, you know, if we're increasing the, um, the amount of money the driver can actually make, then they don't feel they have to steal food. Yeah, what about the laws, though? Um, so I don't know, you know, in the U.S., we have laws where you can't sell food, you can't do this, you got to market as expired, you, you know. So that some of the waste, I'm not saying all of it, but some percentage mm. of the waste at the grocery store level and at the restaurant level, because of the way the laws are, it creates more waste than it otherwise would. And I know you mm-hmm. can't just abandon that and places mm. will sell you bad food or rotten stuff, but yeah. there's got to be, I think, a better balance because that is one source of the waste. There's laws that don't let you give it to these people or recycle it or use it longer or resell it after this date, et cetera. You know? Yeah, and that, and that sort of re- over-regulation, um, it's, it's definitely have its place for safety. You know, food safety is critical. If we're going to be eating at any particular restaurant or cafe, we want to know that the food that we're getting is, is going to be safe to eat. But I think that there, there are, in some instances, some regulations which uh, allow for food that is still consumable, um, but it might be short dated to then go to food charities or food rescue organizations. And uh, I don't know if you have many of them in the States, but we have the Good Samaritan laws here where businesses, restaurants, cafes, catering businesses can donate surpluses that they might have produced for that day to um, some of the food rescue organizations to feed hungry people. Um, so we we do have that support then so that this protects that company. As long as that food that was given to them in good faith, and it's still safe to eat at that moment, then that company is protected. Because that was one of the reasons that a lot of businesses choose not to donate food, any surpluses of food to food rescue organisations, is because they're worried that um, reputation, what about if someone gets sick from eating my food? And this protects them from that. Yeah, no, that's important. Like there's mm. this, uh, this steakhouse you went to a couple of times, and I thought, you know, they should have like a dog shelter right next to it because all the bones and all the meat, (laughs) they don't use it all. They would probably feed the whole friggin' dog shelter. No problem. (laughs) Well, fantastic. There was an interesting relationship between two restaurants here in Melbourne in one of our other states where one of the top class steak restaurants would have all these extraordinary bones left over from magnificent steaks. Uh, and there was another cafe in the city that was called um, Silo, and then its name got changed to Brothel, B-R-O-T-H-L, so it's spelled differently. Um, <laughs> but what it, would do, what it would do, it would take these high-quality bones from this five-star restaurant and produce extraordinary broths and soups with these leftover bones from the best steak in town. Um, so <laughs> a great relationship between businesses. And I, I, I think there's opportunities for that in our cities. We don't think outside of our bubble sometimes. We don't look beyond um, what's right in front of us. Uh, and so there's real chances to, to access different sources of food or, or even how can I offload some of the stuff I have to someone who might find it useful. Yeah, I know that people work in a fish restaurant. We go to every weekend and mm. they're so sick of it that they eat anything else but that. So, I mean, <laughs> restaurants in a community could get together for their mm. workers and say like, hey, I know you guys work at the hamburger place. You're sick to death of it. We like hamburgers because we don't have them. We're in a fish place. And in return, yeah. we'll give you some of our unused food, and you guys can eat it. So, I mean. How brilliant would that be? There's, yeah, there's just level after level after level of stuff that could be done, mm. you know, if someone really wanted to look into it. But I think, it, you know, if each thing chips away, 1% here less, 1% yeah. here less, 2% less, that may be a way to get to a significant amount, maybe 10 15% That's less. A, yeah. For sure. And we saw some of this, um, these relationships between different sorts of food businesses crop up um, in some of our um, suburbs here in, in Australian cities during the COVID lockdowns when um, one restaurant, it wasn't economically viable for them to try and just turn to a, a takeaway or delivery model. So they would produce almost like a dark kitchen and they would produce some meals and sell them through um, a smaller cafe that was able to stay open for, for takeaway food and, and coffee. So you, you found this um, almost a retail offering through other food sellers in the same street. And so businesses started to develop those sorts of partnerships because they still want to stay afloat and keep their brand out there with their customers. It was really interesting. Yeah, there's um, a friend of mine lives near this bakery in Seattle. And again, there's mm-hmm. something in the law where they can't 
they got to mark the you know the, the breads and pastries out so they have like mm. it's weird but they have a, like what they call a sanitary dumpster so to get around the nice. laws they take the bread that's been marked out and they put it in the sanitary dumpster and people go and take stuff out of it it's supposed to be for the homeless or mm-hmm. you know some people are real cheapskates they call them freegans but oh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah they go into this dumpster and they get bread out and and it's still good and they have it but it's sad yeah. they have to do all these crazy machinations because of the law not to try to waste this stuff I, it's so silly I, during um, some of my research that i have done over the years i i interviewed um dozens of businesses about why they chose to donate food or not donate food to food rescue organizations for charities and um and one of the the business managers that i spoke to in a, a small retail outlet said that they, they had store policies that we weren't that they weren't allowed to do that um, and yet you, you could see in the street right outside their their retail outlet that there were homeless people sitting around and so this manager said that he told me in his interview that he would still just take food out there and give it to these guys because it just you can't avoid it yeah. it's right there I I can see this this is part of my world so I, I think we can still be human and, and show our humanity even beyond regulations but has anyone gone through and done a again cradle to grave analysis of every step and every inefficiency in a given food process in a city. I think if you did that, you'd see tremendous opportunities. Oh, we can change this. We can do this. We can do this. And if, you know, again, along the whole chain, if it was really audited and analyzed, you would see there's these 12 places where, you know, food is being wasted. And, you know, you could have a much more holistic program to really help. Yeah. And I think we walking the chain is something that, I know that like the, the organization I'm working with at the moment, Stop Food Waste Australia, our sister organization, which is the Fight Food Waste Cooperative Research Center, um, has a range of um, research projects that are doing that with large commodities. Like, for example, they're doing one with red meat. They're walking the chain on the entire supply chain for red meat to see where waste is occurring across that supply chain to understand, well, what do we really need to do? Let's not make assumptions here. Let's work out how much is wasted at what particular point of the supply chain, and then do deep dives into each of them, like households. Um, they're doing some research on refrigeration, for example, um, what temperatures fridges are, where people store the mm. uh, store, store the meat in the fridge. All this sort of stuff can make a huge difference. Um, but I think I think you, I love your idea of of doing this sort of stuff at the real local level about doing a food map. Uh, walking the chain within that total region here to see that we can avoid maybe some food deserts, work out how we can solve those problems at a local level. Yeah, I mean, even in restaurants too. I remember, we, you know, when I was in New York, we had Hurricane Sandy and a lot of places mm. were closed. And I went to this one diner that was open and they were like slammed, you know. But I remember asking them, what do you guys sell the most of? They said, oh, we go through eggs and I think like hamburgers like crazy. Mm. But I bet you they're not thinking of the 80 20 of their ordering and saying, all right. Mm. These are the items we're selling a lot of. Order more. These are the items we're not selling a lot of. Order less. So there's yeah. also, again, guidance <laughs> for these places on how to order and how to optimize mm-hmm. what they have so they're not wasting too. Because if they have less, less waste, then they have less worry to get rid of stuff. But again, yeah. there's no instruction. There's just don't do this, don't do that. You know? And it could be simple. There are some in the, um, in the food service area, in the hospitality there's a, a whole lot of different apps coming out now and applications that people can attach to their point of sale systems that they have in their stores where they can track and have input into how much food we actually need to buy and, and become much more efficient with their forecasting of, oh, we're going we're gonna to have you know, 500 burgers ordered over the next three days, so we need to have X amount of buns in, we need so many more meat patties and, and all of this. Uh, and Subway, for example, in the, in the States and, and around the world, have a phenomenal um, AI-based system that, that forecasts when they need to put their buns in, the, in that oven so that they're ready in time for the right number of that type of um, sub to be created. So they, they t- it takes all sorts of really cool inputs, not just this is what was ordered last week or yesterday, but last season and what's happening seasonally and other events on in this town. So we can draw this sort of information into our ordering systems today uh, and that can tell us what we can do. Yeah, no, it's a really, really interesting problem with a lot of facets and a lot of ways to solve it instead of just mm. 
like, you know, one blanket <laughs> statement that we have to do this or that. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's more complex. It's not a, it's not as simple as, oh, just, just buy a little less. It's about, well, why is this occurring? Understand, understand the why, I guess. If you take the time to understand, then we can really make a change. And then again, what goals would, would make, a, a, you know, these projects happy? What are their goals and why? Is there a percentage? Is there an amount? It sounds so far like, you yeah. know, it's just nebulous, like, all right, let's make it sustainable or let's reduce food mm-hmm. waste or eliminate it. But maybe that's not realistic. Need a target. Maybe, yeah. maybe in the next year, if they say we could reduce food waste by 5%, exactly. maybe that's huge. That'll represent uh, 12,000 meals or something for the city of Canberra or whatever. You know, yeah, do they, do absolutely. they have goals like that or is it just kind mm. of like we're just trying to make things better but we don't know what better means? Absolutely have to have a roadmap to do that. And what are the what are the milestones you're going to pass along the way? Uh, and so for that that goal of the UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 of halving our food waste by 2030, uh, one of our organisations here in Australia has developed the roadmap about what are the critical things along the way that we have to do to make sure that happens, um, like year by year, so that there are those those goals, those uh, milestones that we have to achieve. And some of that is a certain percentage um, by a certain period of time. And I know like one of the, I was talking to some people in Victoria yesterday and um, their state has um, an interim target of 20% um, by 2025. So they're, they're ch- chipping away there because um, 2025 is not very far away. Um, but, you know, you need to have these interim goals, like you say, Richard, otherwise it's not going to happen. It becomes very nebulous. Yeah. Well, so what do you see as the future of these these projects? Like, what are what do you think is going to be a breakthrough? Where is it going to come from? I think it's going to come from um, a stronger focus on circular economy. And I know that sounds very esoteric in itself, but I think it comes back to understanding closed systems um, and supporting them. I, I see in our governments we're starting to see more and more support for circular economy solutions. Uh, so understanding all of those points within, I guess, it's almost like the hub of a, a bicycle wheel. Like what are all of the the spokes that come off that hub that, that connect into the, the middle of the food system there um, that can have that input and output? And, and then we can affect that sort of change. And I don't know what it's like in the U.S., but in Australia there's a, a lot more government grants um, and innovation in this space to help support and increase the amount of circular economy solutions that come out is it about using that food waste to become a pet food Um, is it around um, creating jobs in regional areas where there are growers already instead of shipping that food to large cities to be processed let's have regional jobs as well Um, so i think that this sort of approach which we're starting to see small steps in um, will be the way that we move forward more and that will create more resilient communities as well as sustainable ones yeah excellent where can people find out more about the work you're involved in? Where can they go? Yeah, in Australia, the, the work in food waste that we're doing, um, if you go to fightfoodwastecrc.com.au uh, and stopfoodwasteaustralia.com.au, you'll see some of the work that we're doing in this area. And uh, my own work um, as well as a consultant, um, I've got a website, dianemcgrath.com.au. Excellent. Well, Diane, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. That's uh... I just think it's a really fascinating topic, and I'm glad we spoke about it. Yeah, same here. I'm glad we went down some of the directions we did, Richard. It was awesome. Don't forget, before you go, use code GENIUS at Viome.com for an additional $20 off your health intelligence test and get started on your health journey with the right foods, supplements, and probiotics and prebiotics for your unique biology. Get a deeper look within with Viome's health intelligence test, Viome. You decoded. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.